Hello everyone, I'm Ben with the BTC Sessions. I'm here in Vancouver at the Catsalano Street Festival, or the Catsalano Street Party, and today I'm doing things a little bit differently for this show. So I am here with Bit National, and we have a booth here. Uh, we're buying and selling crypto, and we're educating people about Bitcoin. Uh, so today what I'm doing is I'm compiling a number of questions that regular everyday people have about cryptocurrency here at the street party and I'm going to answer those questions. So let's check out what burning questions people had. Uh, you've heard of cryptocurrency? Damn right I have. Awesome. Do you currently hold any cryptocurrency? I do. Awesome. I do have a few. Do you have any burning cryptocurrency questions? Yes I do. How does cryptocurrency solve the issue of rapid inflation? Jacques, I really love this question because it beckons to the reason as to why Bitcoin was created in the first place, which was as a way to opt out of the irresponsible practices of central banks as, as uh, the creator of Bitcoin saw it. Um, so with something like Bitcoin, there is a limited supply um, and it was built this way to uh, mirror the gold standard where the money is finite and therefore it doesn't get devalued over time. Um, whereas with our Canadian dollar, with the US dollar, or if you get to the extreme somewhere like Venezuela, um, they can just print money and over time you holding that money, it means that the more is printed, the less your money is able to purchase uh, supply and demand doing its thing. So with something like Bitcoin with a finite amount, uh, essentially you know that you always have a certain percentage of the currency, meaning it's not being devalued over time. Um, but this is not true of all cryptocurrencies. Keep in mind that some have inflation rates. Um, even Bitcoin right now, there are new coins being issued, but you know that at the absolute limit, there is a finite top. Uh, finite ceiling to how many will be created. So make sure whatever cryptocurrency you're dealing with, if this is a uh, feature that is valuable to you, make sure that it does have a cap. I want to know whether exchanges are secure because I have read in the news that they, some in the past have been hacked. So I'm curious as to whether they're secure now and if they're not, whether we can start to exchange cryptocurrencies through our own desktop computers. So first of all, we should quantify secure because um, security is not in extremes. You can't be 100% secure all the time. So when we say secure, secure as compared to what? And in the case of cryptocurrency, the strength in security is that when everyone holds their own keys to their own account um, and privately holds their own money, it becomes exceedingly expensive to attack a whole bunch of individual people and get a large payout. However, when a large number of people leave their money with a central entity, like an online exchange, it becomes a larger payout for a potential hacker. So, a lot of these exchanges get hacked because it's a large honeypot of people entrusting their money to an outside entity and it's all put together in one spot. So that becomes very attractive. Now obviously exchanges want to work as hard as they can to be as secure as they can and I think that will improve over time. But if you want to be the most secure, the best way to go about it is to only have your money on exchanges when you absolutely need to. So if you're buying or selling or if you're trading during the day between multiple currencies. Perhaps there are day traders that need to have money on current uh, currency exchanges and that is just an assumed risk with their occupation. When it comes to trading peer-to-peer, -peer, which is what I think you're talking about here, um, it is possible and it is being built uh, something called decentralized exchanges and something called atomic swaps. And what this enables is uh, essentially more or less a, a contract built between you and an individual where you say, I will give you this amount of coin for this amount of your other coin, whatever, say Bitcoin and Litecoin. I will give you this much Bitcoin in exchange for this much Litecoin. And you create a digital contract, you send your Bitcoin to the contract, 
and the other person sends the Litecoin to the contract, and once the proper amount that is pre-agreed upon arrives, it swaps those coins and sends them out to each other's wallets. What happens if one person doesn't hold up their end of the bargain? After a set amount of time, that money would just revert back to you. So for instance, you send Bitcoin to the contract, this person says, nah, I don't want to send my money, I, I just want your Bitcoin. Well, they can't do that because after X amount of time, maybe you set the contract to expire after 24 hours, that, that timeline comes, there's no Litecoin, the Bitcoin goes back to you. So these solutions are being built. Uh, the part that's difficult is if you inject something like fiat currency, so Canadian dollars, because then you're div dealing with old systems, um, regular banking, and that doesn't jive with cryptocurrency. So all the magic here is with the crypto, um, but when it comes to fiat, you're stuck. Um, a lot of these decentralized exchanges, there's also an issue of liquidity, meaning there are not enough people buying and selling on either side yet to support a good market. Uh, but if you do want to check out one of those decentralized exchanges that is starting to build a little bit more, you can take a look at BISQ, B-I-S-Q, um, and it's a desktop app that you can download and play around with, uh, but the market may not be built up very much to do too many trades yet. And my second question is that I understand that Bitcoin, the blockchain, has never been hacked. It's only the exchanges in the past that have been hacked. But with quantum computing, do you see that changing? And if, the, if that's the case, would other blockchains like Ethereum and all the other ones be at risk? So when it comes to quantum computing, uh, if and when, well, I guess I should just say when, when that happens, um, it won't just be Bitcoin that is affected. Um, literally all computing infrastructure will be affected. Does that mean it's gonna be broken forever? No, you just have to upgrade your encryption method to be quantum resistant. Basically, you're just, your security model has to change. Um, Bitcoin, uh, it is not quantum resistant in its current state. So that means if there was a quantum computer, um, yeah, somebody could break encryption on Bitcoin and move funds around that they should not be allowed to move. This would apply to every single cryptocurrency, but it would also apply to every single bank. Um, so in the grand scheme of things, we would more or less have to look at and realize where quantum computing came to be and in an emergency like that, uh, the majority of network participants, if not everybody, would realize the need to change what is called the uh, proof of work algorithm and uh, to change, I guess, uh, the encryption method behind Bitcoin transactions. And we would just have to find and pinpoint that spot where it happened and perhaps revert back to that point in the blockchain. Uh, to that state of affairs. So you might be reversing some legitimate transactions in that scenario, which wouldn't be great, but it would be better than the alternative. Okay, I'd like to know how I buy something with Bitcoin. There are now a lot of different places that you can spend Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Um, some major examples would be buying flights with cheapair.com. You could uh, get hotel rooms with Expedia.com. Um, you can use a website called purse.io to get discounts on Amazon. Um, and uh, there's a whole list. Um, I'll try to put a link down below to a list of, of Bitcoin related vendors. Uh, but there are more and more popping up every day. Um, you are more likely to find vendors obviously online than brick and mortar because the likelihood of somebody walking into a brick and mortar store, though it's more likely today than it has been in the past, um, odds are if you're accepting as a regular brick and mortar store, um, your Bitcoin spenders will be few and far between. Whereas if you're online, you open your market up to the entire globe and it also helps protect vendors from credit card fraud because they have their funds secure as soon as they receive them. Um, so, in conclusion, lots of places to spend Bitcoin. Uh, you just have to look a little bit. How long until Bitcoin ATMs become as uh, present as hard currency ATMs? So, um, 
I'm working for a company called BitNational. Uh, they have 50 Bitcoin ATMs alone in just Alberta and British Columbia and Canada here. Um, but they are popping up more and more. There's more and more competition everywhere. The interesting thing here is as soon as they're as prevalent as regular ATMs, there won't need to be as many because people will already have cryptocurrency. So the business model over time is that you're trying to onboard people into cryptocurrency and facilitate the trade of regular dollars for Bitcoin or whatever crypto somebody wants to buy. Um, over time, as everybody is using cryptocurrency, if that ends up being the case, well, the ATMs are no longer needed, so the business model changes and morphs with time. Perhaps it becomes education-based, perhaps something else. Uh, but when you see a cryptocurrency ATM absolutely everywhere, um, at that point, the usage starts to go down because the service isn't needed as much. Uh, what kind of reassurances could you tell a person that wants to get into crypto but's worried about the value of a, a coin going to zero, basically? I think this is a great question to end on. Uh, and the reason is, I can tell you all about the benefits of cryptocurrency. I can tell you all about um, how it's better than the current financial infrastructure. I can tell you about how I think it's better than banks and how I think we can all be our own bank and how we can cut out middlemen. Um, I can tell you that uh, it is sound money, that the idea of a finite asset may be attractive to somebody over a long term. I can tell you that, um, that as more people use Bitcoin, the volatility is going down and down further and further, so those price swings become less scary. However, you shouldn't listen to me in any sense you should be doing your own research. Sure, take a listen to what I have to say, but then cross-reference it. Um, the big thing behind cryptocurrency that a lot of people say is don't trust, verify. And that is kind of like the rally call of anybody in cryptocurrency. It's all about eliminating trust and verifying yourself. So take a listen to some of the points I've said in some of these questions, but go research it yourself and fact check what I've been saying. That is the only way that you can assure yourself that you're comfortable using and holding cryptocurrency. And I just want to add one thing to that because the question was framed in an, uh, from an investment standpoint is never ever put any money into any cryptocurrency that you cannot afford to lose. It is still very early days, anything can happen, systems can fail. So you never want to you know, mortgage your house to buy some Bitcoin. You want to be careful and calculated with it. If you believe in the system, then perhaps you want to be holding some type of cryptocurrency. Uh, but that is a decision to be made by you and I encourage you to do your due diligence and be very careful. Do not use money that you want to see back, that you want to see guaranteed coming back to you. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Turn on those notifications so you see when new videos come out and drop a tip if you're able to. Also, if you'd like to help the show in another way, please check out the links down below so that you can grab yourself a hardware wallet to store your cryptocurrency. I'll see you guys next time on the BTC Sessions.